Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our fantastic sponsor, Hunt to Killer. It looks like this winter, many of us will be hiding out inside more than usual. That's why I'm really happy I have a Hunt to Killer subscription, and I recommend that you check out Hunt to Killer for yourself. Hunt to Killer is an amazing subscription box service that is a bit like an escape room in a box. Every month, they send you new clues that help you solve a murder. If you can't wait for the next month's box, just hit the expedite button. Or buy complete box sets so we have several nights of unique entertainment that will beat any night sitting on the couch and watching Netflix. It's a great and inexpensive game night you can do from the safety of your own home. You can even team up with your friends and family on Zoom or Skype. The props are amazing and the storyline is as compelling as a movie or a TV series. Honey Killer subscriptions and box sets also make phenomenal gifts for any mystery or puzzle lovers in your life. It's a thoughtful gift they'll probably never forget. Check out Honey Killer yourself by going to honeykiller.com slash listed and use the promo code criminally listed to get 20% off your first box. Once again, please make sure you use the promo code criminally listed. Get Honey Killer today so you have something fun and original to do at home. You'll also be supporting Criminally Listed. Do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Number 3. Paul Mathers Tooele, Utah is a small city that is about 35 miles from downtown Salt Lake City. On the morning of November 22, 2018, the police in Tooele were called to the apartment of 75-year-old Jean Saron Mathers to do a welfare check. The apartment building's maintenance man had called the police because he had not seen Jean for over a week. Jean had been living in the apartment since December 2007. A few years after moving into the apartment, Jean started using a wheelchair. Police officers got into the apartment and they found Jean's dead body in her bed. She had been dead for at least a week. It looked like she had died from natural causes. The police started looking around the apartment for any clues as to when Jean died. In the utility room, there was a chest freezer. An officer opened the freezer and he found something surprising. It was a large object that was wrapped in black garbage bags. It looked like a human in the fetal position. The officer ripped away some of the plastic and he saw what looked like the heel of a human foot. It turned out that he had found the body of Jean's husband, 69-year-old Paul Edward Mathers. Paul had not been seen in over a decade. The police believe that Paul died between March 2nd and March 5th, 2009. On March 2nd, he went to a doctor's appointment. It was the last confirmed sighting of him. Three days later, on March 5th, Paul's sister came to visit him and Jean told her that he had gone to California. No missing persons report was ever made. At first, the police assumed that Jean killed her husband and then put his body in the freezer. But then they found out that around the time Paul went missing, he was dying of bladder cancer. They found a bizarre letter in the apartment. There are several spelling and grammatical errors in the letter, so I'm going to read it as it was most likely intended to be read. I, Polly Mathers, aka Paula, being a relatively sound mind and cancer-ridden body, make the following statement. I am fully aware with my heart condition, the lower tabs slash hydrocodone will eventually stop my heart. It will not be deliberate as I am not ready to leave my wife, Jean Marie. Jean has foiled my actual suicide attempts. I want it known that Jean is in no way responsible for my death, although that will be what my drama queen mother will claim. My mother, Zeta Lamb, can get on with her life without having to acknowledge that I, her firstborn, am a TG. He then signed off the letter, Paul E. Mathers and Paula E. Mathers. The letter was even notarized. 
Paul's mother had died in 2018, a year before his body was found. It's believed that TG stands for transgender. The medical examiner had blood tests done on Paul's body. When he died, there were lethal levels of prescription drugs. There was also something else unusual about Paul's body. Under the garbage bags that were wrapped around his body, there was a garbage bag over Paul's head, and then the bag was sealed around his head with duct tape that was wrapped tightly around his neck. The medical examiner could not determine if Paul died from natural causes, or if he overdosed on drugs, or if he was asphyxiated with the garbage bag. The medical examiner also couldn't determine if his death was natural, a suicide, or a murder. The police aren't sure if Jean got Paul's body into the freezer herself. Jean was in a wheelchair at the time of her death, but she was not confined to one around the time of Paul's death. Also, Paul was not a large man. The police checked the garbage bags for fingerprints and found none. So it's unclear if Jean had help hiding her husband's body. It is believed that Jean hit Paul's body instead of reporting his death because she continued to collect his benefits for veteran affairs. In total, she was paid over $177,000 in benefits while her husband's body was in the freezer. Although there are many unanswered questions regarding Paul Mather's death, the police consider the case closed. Number 2. Lawrence Batter In the spring of 1957, 37-year-old Lawrence Batter lived in Akron, Ohio. Lawrence had grown up in the city. He had two brothers and two sisters. Their father was a prominent dentist and the family was well-to-do. According to several people, the Batter children were spoiled. When Lawrence was a young man, he was involved in many get-rich-quick schemes that never panned out. He attended university, but he flunked out after a semester. Part of the reason he failed was because he spent too much time running a hamburger stand across the road from the university. Eventually, Lawrence married a woman named Mary Lou. They went on to have three children together. In the spring of 1957, 30-year-old Lawrence was working as a kitchenware salesman. Mary Lou was pregnant with her fourth child. Lawrence was a passionate outdoorsman and he loved archery. On the morning of May 15, 1957, Lawrence played with his children. At about noon, he set off to go fishing. He told Mary Lou that he was going to return home late that evening. After Lawrence left home, he drove to Cleveland, Ohio, where he cashed a check for $400 and then he paid some bills. He then drove to the Rocky River, where he rented a boat. The boatyard owner didn't want to rent Lawrence a boat because there was a storm warning. But Lawrence had convinced him to let him rent a boat, saying he'd be back before the weather got too bad. Lawrence then set off in the boat with his fishing gear and a small suitcase. That night, Lawrence didn't return home. The boat Lawrence had been using washed up ashore about five miles away from the boat yard. Inside the boat was Lawrence's fishing gear, but notably, his suitcase was gone. The area was searched, but there was no sign of Lawrence or his suitcase. The investigators and Lawrence's family thought it was a strange disappearance. There was no evidence that the boat capsized. Also, Lawrence was a strong swimmer. For months, the area was searched, but his body and the suitcase were never found. So the investigators were convinced that he drowned, but they had no idea what else could have happened to him. 
It turns out that at the time of his disappearance, Lawrence was having some serious financial trouble. He had not paid his income taxes from 1952 to 1957. He also had other debts he couldn't pay off and a fourth child was on the way. Things had gotten to be so bad that the milkman was threatening to cut off service. Nevertheless, two years after Lawrence vanished, and even though his body had never been found, Mary Lou had him declared dead. Mary Lou collected $39,500 from a life insurance policy. Accounting for inflation, that is about $366,000 in 2020. Lawrence had paid the premium on the life insurance policy on the day he went missing. Mary Lou started receiving $254 a month from Social Security, which is about $2,300 in 2020. Lawrence's family did their best to move on without him. Eventually, Mary Lou started dating another man. Seven years after Lawrence went missing, in early 1965, Mary Lou was engaged to be married. Then, something very odd happened. On February 2nd, 1965, seven years after Lawrence vanished, a man who lived in Akron and went to school with Lawrence was at a sports show in Chicago, Illinois. He saw a man with a black eye patch over his left eye giving an archery demonstration. He was sure that the man was Lawrence Batter. He called Lawrence's 21-year-old niece, Suzanne Pika, who lived in Chicago. She rushed to the sports show and she immediately recognized the man as her uncle Lawrence. She went up to the man and asked him if he was her uncle Lawrence, who had vanished seven years ago. The man with the eye patch laughed it off and said he wasn't. But Pika was convinced that the man was her uncle. So she called Lawrence's two brothers and told them about the man. They immediately chartered a private plane and flew to Chicago. They went up to the man and confronted him. Once again, the man said he wasn't Lawrence Batter. He said he was John Francis Johnson, but he went by the name Fritz. He lived in Omaha, Nebraska. The Batter brothers asked Fritz to come to the police station so he could get fingerprinted. Lawrence had served in the Navy, so his fingerprints were on file with the FBI. Fritz's fingerprints were compared to Lawrence's fingerprints, and they were a match. When Fritz was told about the fingerprint match, he said it was like a physical shock. Up until that moment, I had no doubt that it was not Larry Badder. But when I heard that, it was like a door had been slammed and someone had hit me right in the face. John Francis Johnson first appeared in Omaha two days after Lawrence went missing. Three days after appearing in town, he was hired as a bartender at a steakhouse. His only piece of identification was a driver's license from the Navy. The license didn't have a photo, just a name. Fritz told people that he was an orphan. He said when he was a baby, he was dropped off at a doorstop in Boston, Massachusetts. He was subsequently taken into an orphanage. He said that all the boys in the orphanage were given the name John Johnson. He had picked up the nickname Fritz, and that's what he preferred to go by. He didn't like people to use his first or last name. Fritz said that when he was 17, he joined the Navy. He claimed he served in World War II and the Korean War. He was discharged in 1957 because he had suffered a back injury. Not long after arriving in Omaha, Fritz got a job as a disc jockey at a local radio station. He later got a job as sports director at the local TV station. In Omaha, Fritz was a celebrity. 
He entered in the city's archery contests and won many of them. He was also well known for his publicity stunts. His best known stunt was to publicize a charity drive for polio. For 15 days, he lived in a box that sat on top of a 50-foot pole. Fritz was also well known for his unconventional lifestyle. He had an apartment that was outfitted with different sized cushions, but no furniture. He and his roommate would host champagne parties in the upper echelon of Omaha society would attend. He also raised hundreds of exotic fishes. Fritz was an affirmed bachelor who railed against marriage. He dated many women in the city. Sometimes he would pick up dates in a hearse that he purchased from a local funeral home. He outfitted the back of the hearse with a bar, a wrought iron coffee table, cushions, and an incense burning Buddha. Although Fritz often spoke out against marriage, in 1961 he married a model and a single mother of one, Nancy Zimmer. Two years later, Nancy gave birth to a son. Fritz also adopted Nancy's daughter. In March 1964, a malignant tumor was found behind Fritz's left eye. The tumor, along with his eye, was removed. After the operation, Fritz wore an eye patch, and this only added to his reputation of being a quirky character. Lawrence's wife, Mary Lou Batter, wasn't happy when she found out that her husband was still alive. She and her family had mourned and accepted his death. After it was revealed that Lawrence was still alive, the insurance company wanted the money back that was paid out on his life insurance policy. Another problem was that Mary Lou was still legally married to Lawrence and she was planning on getting married to her new boyfriend. Mary Lou was Catholic and she was firmly against divorce. Lawrence's re-emergence left her in a relationship limbo. Lawrence Batter, a.k.a. John Francis Johnson, was also potentially in a lot of trouble. By disappearing and his wife collecting the life insurance money, he had committed insurance fraud. Also, when he got married to Nancy, he committed polygamy. When it was revealed that Fritz was really Lawrence Batter, his marriage to Nancy was legally declared null and void. However, Nancy committed to stay with Fritz. Fritz's explanation as to what happened is that he said he suffered from amnesia. For 10 days, a team of psychiatrists and neurologists examined him. They found no evidence that he remembered anything about his life before arriving in Omaha. They also couldn't find an explanation as to what would have caused the amnesia. After it was uncovered that Fritz was really Lawrence Batter, he continued to go by the name Fritz and he remained in Omaha with his second wife, his son, and his adopted daughter. Fritz told a reporter that he wouldn't talk about his previous life. He said, I'm sorry, but my doctors have warned me not to try to figure it out by myself. They say it might hurt me. In mid-1966, a little more than a year after Fritz was found at the sports show, the cancer that led to his eye being removed came back. On September 16, 1966, Lawrence Joseph Batter, a.k.a. John Francis Johnson, a.k.a. Fritz, died at the age of 39 in Omaha. He was buried in Akron, and his headstone reads Lawrence J. Batter. When he died, the legal problems surrounding his disappearance and reappearance were dropped. Number 1. Granger Taylor Granger Taylor was born on October 7, 1948, on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. When he was young, his father drowned. His mother eventually remarried. 
When she got remarried, Taylor had two siblings, and his stepfather had four children. His mother and stepfather had a son together. The family lived on a farm in Duncan, British Columbia. Duncan is a small city on the southern end of Vancouver Island. While Taylor lived there, it was a logging and fishing town. Taylor dropped out of school when he was in the 8th grade. He had an amazing mind when it came to machines. His friends and family said they could build or fix anything mechanical. When Taylor was just 14 years old, he got a frame from an antique car out of a field and he built his own car. In 1969, when he was 21, he found an abandoned 1910 locomotive in the woods not far from his home. It had been abandoned decades earlier and it was covered in moss. The engine had been dynamited and the undercarriage had been stripped during World War II. Within a year, Taylor had restored the locomotive and built a 100-yard railroad in his parents' backyard. In the mid-1970s, Taylor bought a fuselage from a P-40 Kitty Hawk fighter plane in a scrapyard. The other parts of the plane had been hacked off with an axe. He purchased the fuselage and some original landing gear. From there, he rebuilt the plane with only photographs as his guide. For materials, he used old water heaters and metal signs. He ended up selling the completed fighter plane for $20,000. Granger Taylor was shy and introverted, and he hardly, if ever, dated. He seemed happiest when he was working on his projects. Taylor acted as a mentor to young men in the neighborhood. If they refused to go to school, he would keep them out of trouble and try to teach them something by getting them to help with his projects. In the late 1970s, Taylor became interested in outer space and the possibility of alien life. Over the course of the year in the late 1970s, he built what he called a spaceship in his parents' backyard. Inside of the spaceship was a wood stove, a couch, and a TV. The spaceship was never meant to fly. Instead, it was a hangout for Taylor and his friends. Often, Taylor would sit in the spaceship for hours at a time and just think. Sometimes, he slept in the spaceship. Shortly after completing the spaceship, Taylor started telling friends and family that one day, he would get in contact with aliens and they would give him knowledge. Then Taylor told people that he had developed a radio that he used to communicate with the aliens. He also told people that the aliens were communicating directly with his mind. He told friends and family that the aliens had invited him to come and meet them. Granger Taylor didn't come across as delusional to the people close to him. They thought he was happy that the aliens had chosen him. Taylor told people that the aliens would come for him on a rainy night. He said that the weather would hide their ship from the rest of the Earthlings. It is important to note that around this time, Taylor was supposedly doing a lot of LSD. In June 1980, Taylor wrote out his will with a do-yourself will kit. In one passage that was pre-printed on the will when he purchased it, he crossed out the word funeral, and he also crossed out the word death and wrote the word departure. On the evening of November 29, 1980, a terrible thunderstorm blew into the area. Taylor wrote the following note to his parents. Dear Mother and Father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship as recurring dreams assured a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe, then return. I am leaving behind all my possessions to you as I will no longer require the use of any. 
Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. He then stuck the note to the door of his parents' bedroom. Taylor drove to his favorite restaurant in town where several people he knew were dining. He told them he was heading off into space and he said goodbye to everyone. He then stopped off at the house of one of his best friends, Robert Keller. He told Keller he was going off to space. Keller asked if he could go with him and Taylor said he couldn't because he had more to do here on Earth. Taylor then got into his 1972 Datsun truck and he drove off into the night. No one saw or heard from 32-year-old Granger Taylor ever again. His parents reported him missing a few days later. For months, searches were conducted, but no trace of him or his truck were found. Supposedly, his mother and stepfather fully expected him to return. For years, the family left the back door unlocked in case Taylor ever came back home. They also kept his bedroom exactly the way it was on the night he left. In March 1986, five and a half years after Granger Taylor disappeared, some forestry workers were at Mount Prevost, which isn't far from the farm where Taylor lived with his parents. They came across what looked like a blast site. It was apparent that a large explosion had happened there. They found debris from a light blue dancing truck. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police also known as the RCMP, were called in. The area was searched and two pieces of human bone were found. Also, a piece of fabric was found. The RCMP's automotive division determined that the truck parts were from Taylor's truck. His mother also recognized the piece of fabric. It was from a shirt that she had made for him not long before he went missing. The pathologist determined that the bone fragments belonged to Granger Taylor. The coroner's office pronounced Granger Taylor dead and the official cause of death was injury due to the consequence of an explosion. The coroner's office and the RCMP both consider the case officially closed. But not everyone is convinced that Granger Taylor died on the mountain. Some people believe that Taylor was actually taken by aliens and he's still traveling around the universe. They think that he may return one day just like he promised in his letter. Taylor's friend, Robert Keller, doesn't believe that the evidence is conclusive enough to prove that Taylor died by suicide. For example, he knew that Taylor didn't have enough explosives to obliterate himself and the truck. Also, parts of a blue Dotson truck were found. Keller claims that he and another friend helped Taylor paint the truck Pepto-Bismol pink not long before he went missing. Keller also points out that there's no definitive proof that the bone fragments were Taylor's. Notably, no DNA tests were performed on the fragments. In the years since the bone fragments were found, they have been lost again, and no one knows where they are. Another problem is the blast site is now lost, so no further evidence will probably ever be found. Some people believe that the truck was destroyed, and someone else's bone fragments were left to simply look like Ranger Taylor had died on the mountain. Robert Keller said that Taylor had told him a few days before he disappeared he was going to have to dispose of the truck. He said that Taylor told him that he didn't want anyone looking for him because it would be a waste of time because he would be in space. In 2018, a Datsun truck that was around the same age as Taylor's truck was found on Mount Prevost. This photo was taken of the truck. However, since the photo was taken, the logging roads have been changed and no one has been able to find the truck again. 
Some people believe that Taylor was kidnapped and now works in Area 51. Other people think he relocated to Columbia. Other people, including Robert Keller, believe that he's somewhere out there in the universe. Another possibility is that Taylor died in an accident. Taylor kept dynamite in his truck to blow up tree stumps. Something, possibly a crash, could have caused the dynamite to explode, killing him. Other people, including some of Taylor's siblings, think that he did some amazing things while he was alive, but he was a depressed and lonely man who tragically took his own life. He may have come up with the alien story because to him, it was better for his friends and family to think that he was on some space adventure instead of dead because he had taken his own life. If that was the case, he may have been successful because people think that's preferable for people like Robert Keller to believe that Taylor's in space instead of accepting the idea that he took his own life. Or the alien stories could have been a result of his LSD usage. After their parents died, Granger Taylor's sister took over the house and she kept Taylor's room the way he left it when he went missing 40 years ago. Unfortunately, while the case is officially closed, there are many unanswered questions about what really happened to Granger Taylor.